all right, um, I tried to do something very different and I wasn't very successful. Last time when we did summaries, we did summaries according to the different facets. This time I tried to do it purely astrologically. I almost went, did, went down the list of all of the planets and tried to make a sentence for each one of the planets, but that would have given it a not balanced summary. This is mu it's much harder to do this because uh, if you're working with the facets, you can do much more comparison and you can fuse things together. And uh, that's the object of when you're doing the summary is to fuse it together and to synthesize it all into one thing. As it turns out, what I came up with uh, sounds much more like a restatement of all the astrological things in more broad terms, which I guess is a kind of a summary. And so there is uh, nothing really insightful, very little that is uh, synthetic in it. Uh, so it'll just be really, really simple, and we could be out of here in a really short amount of time, though nobody believes that. All right, we're looking at the Frida Kahlo horoscope first. And the first thing is there are more trials and difficult circumstances in this life than there are pleasant and easy things. She must make the best of difficult circumstances and problems in her character. That's a good summary. Does anybody know where that summary is coming from? No, what we're doing is pure counting. You're close, you're in the right direction. The amount of um, positive aspects or pleasant aspects versus the number of unpleasant aspects is what we're trying to get at with this. And that's usually you can indicate, you can see from that whether an easier life or a harder life is, in, is, is indicated just by a quick glance. That's a good way to summarize. Yep. Yes, and squares. Very few positive aspects. It can go either way, but in this case, all of the conjunctions are also involved with oppositions or squares. And for that reason, the conjunctions as you have to be seen as more negative than positive. Okay. Most of the trials are of an adversarial nature, making it very difficult for her to distinguish which problems are in her, which are in the people she plays off of, and which are in both. All right, we're talking here now about the fact that most of the trials are come from oppositions. And when you're in an opposition, you're always pitted against someone else. Even if, no matter what side of the opposition you're on, you'll be pitted against somebody else. And so <coughs> when that's the case, it's very easy to project and see the problems in someone else. So this works out all right for summary also. The other trials are blocks or obsessions and they are of a dark and heavy nature, and mostly emotional, but they are framed in an intellectual background. We're talking about the squares of Pluto and Venus to Saturn. So the first three sentences uh, are all about aspects. And since uh, aspects are probably the most important part of astrology in the, in the sense that it works and that you can really get at things, uh, you, that's why I let off working completely with aspects. The character traits or talents at either end of her vacillations or mood swings are intense, pointed, and concentrated. All right, and that's another sentence on aspects, and it's talking about the fact that uh, the, um, there are conjunctions at either end of the oppositions. And that's why they're that that's why they're pointed and why they're intense and concentrated. Even though they're oppositions, you know there are talents to an opposition, and they're not necessarily talents of doing bad things. They can be very good talents under trying circumstances. The ex 
extreme in her vacillating character that has to do with how she sees herself is likely to be moody, imaginative, and spiritual. Now we're talking about the, the, all of the stuff in Cancer primarily, but for that, that which has to do with the sun. And then we're, then when we're talking about both ends of the opposition is what we're talking about the next sentences. Next sentence. The extremes of her vacillating character are about her lovers, and they are external, fierce, explosive, and radically expansive. They are about what she considers archaic conventions and traditions. In this case, we're talking about the other end of the opposition. Uh, you know, we're talking about Mars and Uranus is very explosive. And looking, you know, she's again fighting with traditions. Another general statement, she's highly unpredictable even to herself. And that's the way it is with creative people. If it, if it, if it isn't unpredictable, you're not, you're not being creative. You know exactly what's going to happen already. You're, you're just playing something out. You're not creating. Any questions, Paul? You're, you're getting now what we're doing. Now you're better. Good. There are many layers of inversions, reversals, and contradictions in the heart of her being. For example, she tries to be revolutionary in her impersonal attitudes about her personal lovers and personal about what are normally impersonal relationships, such as friendships. So she's being new, in the sentence before this, we saw she was trying to be new about all things, and now we're seeing that she tries to be impersonal about things that are really personal, and in the personal part comes from the 11th house, being personal about friendships, which are supposed to be impersonal. Uranus, even Capricorns, coolly impersonal. She is likely to be highly spiritual in her inner being, but she is way too radical and innovative to be a religious individual. Though her political philosophy and theory of art may seem like religion to some. All right. Yes. I don't think so. I think there's way too much uh, Uranus in it. Uh, it just doesn't smack of a highly religious chart. All right. Yes, that's what we, ju what we just said. We, she was spiritual, but but not religious. Yes. Yeah. yeah. She is highly creative. And her creativity is born in seeing things from different viewpoints as she passes through her mood swings. This is a little bit more explanatory sentence. We're trying to indicate how creativity happens. And, uh, creativity happens usually in times of change. It doesn't happen when, there are, when everything is all pleasant and even and going on going regularly. Everything gets taken for granted and one goes into kind of some kind of creative slumber and is, does not do things in a new way. Outwardly, she seems bright, but in her brightness, she seems different from the world, and she may not see the difference because the truth of intuitive experience, in the truth of intuitive experience, there should be a comma after experience, the difference seems natural to her. If anything, it is the world that has it all wrong and that needs waking up. Again, we're trying to be a little bit more uh, uh, a little bit more explanatory. The outward brightness is for Leo rising, and but she sees. She seems different from the world. Anybody with that much Uranus and Neptune is going to seem different from the world, but because she has all these intuitive experiences, everything seems true to her, especially the things happening in Cancer. Everything is all natural. 
And so she would then think it's the world that needs to wake up. And this is one of the difficulties with revolutionaries. I remember here back in the 60s when people took to the streets and they said, we've got to change the system. And I could see they were never going to go anywhere because nobody was working on changing themselves. They, you know, they, they could intuitively see that what was out there wasn't right, at least to their eyes it wasn't right. And <clears throat> when that's the case, Unless you change yourself, you can't really do anything to change the world. At least nothing lasting. Maybe it will blow up a few things or something like that. But, uh, all right. She's highly intuitive. And the outer world is just another source of intuition, for intuition. All right. So far, this gives a pretty good picture of her overall. It's a, a little bit too ostensive and not enough explanatory. But uh, it's reasonable as, uh, as a summation. Her intuitions might not always be true due to the turbulent nature of her life inwardly, but she is likely to act on them impulsively anyway. We're saying that the cancer gets turbulent, when there's a lot of back and forth, and when there's a lot of intuition, and in that turbulence, one cannot reflect on what her intuition really is. But because the Iranian martial qualities are so strong, she just goes ahead and acts, and there is impulsiveness in that. All right, number 14. Even the nature of intuition and the truth of which intuition is an expression are a matter of contention because she relies on both the first thought intuition which is born whole on the fly while she is doing things and the more connected intuition which she experiences in imaginative processes all right everybody understands what we're what we're doing there it's hard to tell which is which the Iranian intuition is usually the first thought intuition, in, in, and uh, it's born whole. And it's born when she's doing things. Uranus is in a cardinal sign, and it's together with Mars, who is the doer of everything. The more connected intuition is the Neptunian intuition, and she experiences that in imagining, in, in the cancel things. Did you, did you say you had some sentences? Later, uh, about, about 11.30? Um, okay, then 11.45. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Paul, do you have any uh, sentences? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. You're a poker player then. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I, 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 no, I, 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 maybe the... Yeah, all right. The, the, isn't it, wasn't it right in the assignment that I pass, passed out? Oh, I gave the wrong assignment. Oh. Oh. Well, it's all on me. I can't rag on you anymore. <laughs> The irregular, vacillating, and impulsive tendencies are stronger than the dark, obsessive, blocking tendencies. That's good for summary because we recognize that the oppositions in general are stronger than the squares. The darker trials may be a consequence of the more preemptive pattern of her being from exhaustion if for no, if for no other reason. And what we're saying there that there's some kind of compensation in the soul that because on one hand she is so 
so push, 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 uh, that leads, you know, what is now called bipolar qualities, where on one hand there's too much uh, uh, dashing out there and then a person gets tired or psychologically tired and then they turn dark. Uh, manic depression. The darker trials, all right, the darker trials also have relief through a well-controlled imagination that is nothing short of creative genius. And that is talking about the sextile of Saturn to the moon, and the moon is exactly in the Pleiades where the creativity and the genius is to be found. Yeah. The last degree of Taurus. That is at this time in history, it changes, it moves about uh, 59 seconds a year, I believe, and it goes through one degree every 72 years. The fire and water impulsive turbulence does not have relief and it is likely to be self-perpetuating, saying that she's probably never getting off the seesaw, it's going to go up and down and up and down, she's never going to get off. Imagination is the common factor between the two patterns and when operating from either she is not likely to let go of it. In the, mighty, in the heavier imaginative pattern she is likely to obsess about the object of her imagination and in the more dynamic imaginative pattern there is a need to not let go until she has proven herself. We're getting a little bit more um, explanatory here, a little more exp ex uh, exploring the meaning. What we mean to say is that in both patterns, my card, in, yeah, you have to share with her because I think we're all, oh no, there is one left. Because you came late, you have to stay late. <laughs> <laughs> until at least at least until about 11:30 when I'm meeting her. <laughs> what we're trying to um, say here is that the squares have imagination, and the opposition has imagination, and. In either case, she's not likely to let go of them. She's not likely to let go of the squares because both Pluto and Saturn are die-hard planets. She's not likely to hang out, to let go of the, the imagination and the opposition because there's a certain amount of insecurity in there and she has to hang on until she can prove it to herself that she has some security. All right, we're at sentence number 20. Unlike most imaginative people, she is not highly nurturing, though there are plenty of opportunities to be so. Either she is so preoccupied with things on which she obsesses, or she is so caught up in the flurry of contrary turbulence that she does not take time to give the care necessary for nurture. All right. Uh, the... Uh, Nurture would be or usually be the moon, or it would be water signs, most especially cancer. But in this case, the planets that are in cancer are uh, so much involved with the excitement that you can't nurture when you're when you're acting that revolutionary. And she gets so obsessive about the uh, things that have to do with the T-square sextile that. That there isn't really time to do, time or energy to do nurture in that. From her life, we know she was intelligent, but from her horoscope, we, it can be seen that the concrete mind was not her first or even second choice of faculties. We're talking about the fact that Mercury is unaspected and it's stuck in the twelfth house. So that it doesn't mean that she doesn't have a mind and the mind isn't strong, 
but in the astrological balance of things, she that is not where she goes to. You know, she it, she uses it, but it it isn't a uh, a deliberate thing to meditate on what is going on. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because they just weren't interested in, in being a pure mentalist or doing a lot with the mind. You know, the mind can inhibit, this is a speculation, but the mind can inhibit a lot of intuition. You think on things too much, you know, like a person who is strongly mental, if you look at their handwriting, everything is connected. Sometimes even words are connected together in the handwriting. If you take the person who is intuitive, uh, there are breaks all over the place. Even within a word, uh, a word, there are breaks. And that is the kind of consciousness that is necessary to be open, to have, uh, you know, if you have the con continuity of thought, that makes something seamless. Plus the fact that the thought usually is after the fact, and it, it's not an, always an accepting thing. And it's, uh, in this horoscope, it looks like She's not focusing on the mind because she wants to focus on intuition. And if she were to become too mental, that, that would be inhibitive of the intuition. The best is if you can get the mind working with the intuition, but lacking that, it's probably better to have the intuition without the mind than, than uh, to be a, a mentally perfect person and not have any intuition. No, it would be uh, more like Mercury and Neptune or Mercury and Uranus trying. Something like that, or sextile. All right. We're at number 22. The dominant imaginative part of her being might consider thinking as something tasteless. And the more intuitive or impulsive part of her being might consider it as consider a lot of thinking as unnecessary. Intuitive people are like that. <laughs> yeah. Why think about it? I've got the truth. There's no reason no, no reason to think about it. And if you you know if you if you're a visual person and you're used to blending colors and shapes together, those ugly things that we call letters are kind of gauche. And that's, that's the kind of thing I'm trying to get at. Not that she was incapable of it. You know, she was capable of writing, but that, that wasn't, wasn't her, uh, what she most wanted to do. As a consequence of this attitude, she is likely to repair to it only or in afterthought after the excitement is over and she is isolated alone with the consequences of her impulses. So in the, after the only, this should be an end. Well, that's not so bad. We got through two pages with only missing a comma and one little word. And it wasn't an important word like love. All right, you understand what we're trying to say here. Uh, we're trying to dis understand the in the general scheme of things where the mind does fit in. It rises after the sun. Uh, the sun was up probably a couple hours almost before Mercury rose. And um, no, hour, hour and a half maybe. And um, that means an afterthinker. And if she's in the flurry of all of this activity, or if she's in one of those states that's almost what you're so right-brained that you're stunned in, uh, in uh, looking at things or imagining things, it's only when that's over that you can think about it. And maybe this is the kind of life that the, she only thinks when she is uh, bedridden or something like that. All right, and the final summary sentence really is a summary. This is a life of enormous suffering and self-generated instability, both of which are highly productive of intuition and creativity. I think that sums the character up if you had to say it in one sentence. 
it's a horrible thing to do to try to sum up a whole character in one sentence, but uh, I think that would uh, do a reasonable job of it. Do you have any sentences, Julie? Do you have any sentences? <laughs> I'll have to sentence you. <laughs> All right. You're in kind of a serious mood tonight. I'm tremendously volatile. Started yesterday. And I'm not explosively volatile, but I can burst into tears or I can burst into laughter at, 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 at uh, a moment's notice. And I don't know what it is. Yeah, we switch. Yeah, yeah, but I'm, 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 I'm right on the edge. You know. Just don't ask me to marry you. Yeah, but sometimes uh, uh, Aries people are into being seen. Not as much as Aquarius, but uh, are you are you the one from the cops parking lot down here? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Terry says, I'm going home scandalized one more time. <laughs> uh, all right. We're moving. No, no. But in her case, that's the way she does it. Uh, but usually, in the, in, in the intensity of battle is when more things are created. It's a different kind of creation. Like the creation that is divine creation is something that's in the divine consciousness is held and things congeal and they resolve and it's a very slow, peaceful thing. But when it gets all the way down to this level and things have to be done, uh, then the creation happens when there are right in the midst of the action. I don't think so. Okay. I would have guessed in the 50s. I'll have to look it up if you like. All right. Montaigne. This individual is likely to be very much before the eyes of the world as someone famous who has the ears of higher ups, as someone who is known through travel, and as someone with many strong friendships. All that is is a statement about all those planets at the top of the chart. It's somebody that's going to be before the world. There's only one planet that is really substantially below the horizon in the more personal sphere of activity, and that's the moon. Everything else is either on the horizon, but mostly way up above. And that's somebody who's likely to be famous, and somebody who's likely to be traveling, and then there are all those inclinations to uh, friendships. This is someone who is generally emotional in person, in individuality, even in mentality. It's a summary statement because uh, uh, five planets and the ascendant are in water signs. In fact, the other primary angle, the tenth house, is also in watery signs. So we can see right off the bat that this is somebody that's going to be emotional, a feeler. The general demeanor of this individual is not masculine. There is a gentleness that is almost feminine and perhaps even androgynous. The Mars is not a really strong planet, which is one of the usually where most masculinity comes from. The uh, Sun, which is the other strongly masculine planet, is in Pisces, which is gentle and meek and mild, and uh, has Cancer rising, which is also a kind of a soft demeanor.
The androgyny would come from the Uranus being in the first house, <coughs> which would indicate somebody uh, 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 that had a personality or outer looks that were like that. Despite being illustrious, famous, and well-traveled, this individual may be shy and retiring and may have peculiar ways about himself both inwardly and outwardly. All statements about the same thing. The planets in the water signs. Pisces is very shy. Uh, the uh, Cancer is shy. So we're, we're seeing all of those things. Yes. Yes. Aquarius. But, it's, but the, ten, the, tendency, the tendency to friendships is still there. The ruler of the house of the friendships is in Aquarius. This is the first man to write an essay on friendship. And the, what, well, how the, to put it in modern parlance, how would you say it? Ralph Waldo Emerson did a cover <laughs> on uh, the essay on friendship that Montaigne wrote. What? Remix, okay. That's, the, that's an even newer term than cover. Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> the trying circumstances or problematic parts of the character are likely to be equal to the positives and the talents, and they are also likely to be more intense. In general, the balance between trial and ease is well balanced, which should make uh, for a well-balanced life and character. Too many words in there. You throw a third of the sentence away. The trying circumstances uh, are, are, are likely to be a little bit stronger because of the uh, strong square of Jupiter and Neptune and Jupiter and the Sun. But in general, there are many, as many positive things as there are negative things, is what we're trying to get at. Counting up aspects again. Put it in a little different order in this time. The entire character with the exception of the concrete in the entire character with the exception of the concrete mind, there is a tendency to exaggerate or do things to excess or carelessness. There's some words missing there. Though not vigorous, he will not stint in anything. Oh, exaggeration or excess or carelessness. All right, that's all right. I just read it wrong. All right, you understand what is here. We're saying that the uh, the greatest faults in the chart. We've gone from counting up the balances between positive and negative aspects to looking at what the uh, negatives are, and what we're saying is that they have to do with exaggeration or excess or carelessness. You need to say that that's not necessarily bad, but it, it means that he can be uh, generous. He'll be calmly generous. The general character is likely to be both spiritual and religious. Though he would like to be orthodox in both, he is more likely to be different in both. In the spirituality, we look for Uranus and Neptune. They're both very, very active. But for the religion, we look at, there are two planets in the ninth house, and wherever Jupiter's involved, there's likely to be a lot of orthodoxy in religion. And so we have a combination of both. In his general unorthodox, his general unorthodoxy is not a matter of intention. Instead, it is a consequence of intuitive experience in his inner being and in response to things in the outer world. So we're saying that he gets intuitions from within, from Neptune, and that has him seem strange. And then when he's looking at the other world, he notices things that heretofore have not been noticed in that way, and he gets intuitions about them. And that leads to something being very, very different inwardly and outwardly. Because of his concentrated intellectual focus on the outer world, he is able to see things 
and noticing things in a different way, he is suddenly open to streams of intuition, much to the chagrin of the focal agency, which is intensely seated in the past. He is an anachronism, whether he likes it or not. All right, this is talking about the whole pattern of Mercury with Saturn, Uranus, and the Ascendant. This Mercury, Saturn is the concentrated intellectual focus and since it's on the ascendant, it's on the outer world. And because of that, he's able to see differences. Saturn discriminates differences, and Uranus sees things in a new way. And then that suddenly opens him up to all kinds of intuition. But the Saturnine part of himself doesn't like that because it would rather have a more stable kind of world. And it would rather uh, like tradition. So he's anachronistic, part of him pulling toward the past, but uh, suddenly thrown into the future or into the now in ways that are unprecedented. Just wait till the next assignment. We're going to really test you on that. And this time we'll make sure I got you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Eventually we might do that. But you don't get to go along to the 8th house field trip. <laughs> no, we're not going to go to a mortuary. I was thinking more of a body house. What? Body house. <laughs> you live on an alley? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Number 10. Inwardly, he tries to focus to a point and also awakens intuition. But when he does, he waxes expansive and enthusiastic. He gushes forth with all sorts of ideas, which, though general, are very much about himself and how he sees things as an individual. We're talking exclusively about the T-square here focused on the sun. His attempt to try to focus things to a point is the conjunction between Neptune and uh, the sun. And then he starts having, he awakens the Neptunian qualities and then he's, the Jupiter kicks in and he gushes forth all kinds of things. Uh, I know that my friend, that can be see in myself. But because the sun is in the middle of it and because there's the personal qualities from the fourth house, it's always about him. And it's not necessarily about things in, the, in themselves. It's not impersonal in that way. His optimistic expansions tend to get out of bounds and he may tend to neglect details in a way that is almost superstitious, which when they recoil, may cause him to be punctilious, especially in his home life. Now we're talking there about the T-square again, but this time we end up talking about the uh, moon in Virgo in the fourth house. That's always what happens when you are a Jupiterian exaggerator. You expand things so big, and then somebody comes along with a fact that pokes a hole in them. And then you promise yourself that you're going to be ever more scrupulous about those little things, and it never works. You start getting scrupulous about them, and then the whole cycle starts all over again. You concentrate, and you get ideas, and pretty soon you're all, all over the board. All right. No questions, no comments, no rotten tomatoes. Yes? Punctilious is when you're real fuddy, fussy about each little detail. Punctilious people, you have to be exactly on time. It's, it's not like you're pulling off a heist and you synchronize your watches and things like that. Okay. Though generally emotional, his emotions are most likely to be of a religious or spiritual nature. He is not apt to passion. He is not strong in filial love, nor is he likely to abundance of male-female romance. 
but he is strong about friendship in which he is very generous almost as though it were a religious duty that has taken hold and become second nature to him. We're talking about mostly about all of, we're talking about the emotional nature, basically. It, the Mars isn't real strong, so he's not apt to passion. And the moon isn't especially strong, and it's in sort of a dry planet, uh, dry sign in Virgo, so it's not really filial. And Mars, Venus are too Aquarian to really be romantic in the male-female sense but he is strong about friendship because of all of the things in Aquarius. And, we, and he's likely to be very, very generous toward his friends. Venus is sextile Jupiter, very generous in general, but especially with friends when it's in Aquarius like that. As though it was a religious duty, we're still talking about Venus in Aquarius in the 10th house. Yes. I don't know that the moon does rule the whole horoscope. It, it, it rules the ascendant, and that is often in the, an indicator of the rule of the horoscope, more often than not. But because there are planets in here that have so many strong aspects, uh, we, I'd have to do a calculation. Uh, and to see which planet does come out strongest, but I'd be likely to guess at first chance that it was probably uh, Jupiter would probably be the ruler of this horoscope. That's a good idea, though. I, I neglected to do that. I never thought of it. I should have uh, picked out a life ruler, the life ruler for both of the charts, and then addressed myself to the life ruler in, in terms of the summary. See, you're way ahead of me. Yeah. She gets a smug. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, this is the next sentence is astrological, but we're, we're not trying to not be astrological here. He has half of the planets in two signs, Aquarius and Pisces, which are the most universalizing signs. And this again reiterates the tendencies in, in attitude to universalize and expatiate. And since astrological redundancy magnifies tendencies, it shows him to be a generalist, while the aspects to Jupiter show him to be an exaggerated generalist. Yeah. Uh, that's a good summary sentence. Yeah, it, 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 uh, it, it relates to the facts. It relates to the facts in proportion. And uh, it, it covers a lot of ground. That's what, that's what you're supposed to do in the summary. Once in a while, I get one right. <laughs> All right. However, though he may have his personal peculiarities and he may tend to exaggerate things, it would not be correct to consider him a wide-eyed fanatic or anything like that because he is, much, he is too much of a genteel gentleman to be that, and he is noble, noblesse oblige in all. We're talking about, we're, we're talk, this is all basically this time about the 10th house, Sun and Neptune. He has peculiarities, personal and spiritual, but personal peculiarities are from Uranus in the first house. And he does tend to exaggerate things, we know that from the squares, but he's not fanatical. There's nothing in here that would indicate that he insists on his way and tries his to force everything his way. He's much too much, a generalist is kind of hard to be a fanatic. And um, he's very genteel, he's soft and gentle and all of that. And noblesse oblige, I think that whole T-square with the sun and Jupiter, he has that attitude. Like I have to, since, I'm, since I am a noble, I have to act like one and therefore I have to be generous. He probably was way more generous with uh, the people who served him uh, than was, than was normal in his time. You, you, were you saying something, Terry? No, oh, okay. I'll try, I just gotta engage you in class some way, right? <laughs> All right. Though he is not a Hercules of will, 
he does have a hidden source of will which he can draw upon that is sufficient to keep his character from losing form and to keep him from drifting into decadence. We're talking about Pluto in its sextiles with the Sun and Neptune and we're saying that that is a, a willpower that, that he can hold himself in shape it. Because if it were only the T square to the Sun and Neptune, it would, uh, you know, it would be uh, the, 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 like the character would almost like drift apart like clouds that are, you know, how, when, when they break up, something of that character. It's the picture that I get. I'm warming you up for the assignment, which is all about pictures poetic images and things like that. All right. There is clearly a defined restraint and cautious definition in mind and in self that while not dominant in the character is strong enough in poem to the general character to be able and enable it to be useful and functional where exaggeration and carelessness might not do so. His research and especially his writing are the vehicles for bringing these factors into play. So here, we're, this is another correcting sentence. We talked about all the generalization and the broadness of the character, which describes uh, very carefully. But now we're saying that there are two things that keep it from uh, being too diffuse of a character, and they are the Pluto and the Mercury and we're especially the Mercury being uh, involved with Saturn and Saturn and Pluto are the two people who bring discipline and control and uh, focus to life. His personal and subconscious activity are instrumental in keeping him down to earth and in it he will feel inwardly uncomfortable in ways that are undeniable if he tends to drift off too much into spiritual reverie. We're saying that we're talking here, the personal is all the stuff in cancer, and especially being involved with the personality through the, the physical body in the first house, and the subconscious is the moon which rules the personality and being on an earth sign, it keeps him down to earth, and uh, there's a certain amount of discomfort, both from the Uranus, but especially from the moon. It's, uh, there's something that, that is irritable if he doesn't take care of things. Uh, there's something that, uh, you know, that, that gets to his consciousness. All right, number 18. This is a character that is generally lofty and cultured, with generous, gentle, generous sentiments, high ideals, and sufficient intellectual interest to be socially acceptable without being tedious or boring. General summation of things. All fairly obvious. It's a restatement of things. There's nothing wrong with making restatements, as long as you restate from a different point of view and you get the, the picture more clearly or you bring out some facet in the process of doing so. His spirituality and religiosity approaches superstition, but if it becomes excessive, a, a plaintive scholasticism engages him to prevent him from becoming a fool. That's the punctilious part again. All fairly simple. We know him really well now. We can write the book on him. By the way, have you written any book? Yeah. Well, you, the longer it takes, usually the better the sign it is. Yeah, I think so, because it has to go up and down the ladder of people who read it. I've heard that the best thing is to do the Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. Any questions on anything we've done? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, but this is much easier, but I don't think it was as good a quality as it was last week, because it's hard to do that with doing this kind of thing. 
because the other, you, you know, you'll, it's like you're looking with a God's eye view. And you're looking and you're seeing the desire body and the mental body and all of those things. And you're seeing, uh, you know, proportionately how strong they are relative to each other and how well they work together with each other. It's a harder thing to do, but I think it's a much better way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But you get used to my fuddy language. <laughs> All right. This is the assignment. It is, uh, we're doing something new. We're going to be verbal, but not so much verbal as using images. I took eight different horoscopes, and I took a little piece out of each of the horoscopes. And you're supposed to make some kind of metaphor or simile or uh, a tone picture or poetic image or something like that. Everybody except the professional writer, the, the professional writer has to not only give a metaphor, she has to go beyond it and give a meta five. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Now, she 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 gets to she gets to comment on what you do and teach, <laughs> teach other people what you meant, <laughs> whether it was or not. <laughs> um, you can make as many pictures as you want, and some of these are a little bit complex. And uh, so you can only take one small part of them. You don't have to make a picture for the whole thing. Yes, they're all famous people. <laughs> we haven't. I don't know. Well, I mean, out of the four that I've been around for, it was a Yeah, yeah it's, none of the, it's none of those four. <laughs> no. Uh, there's one in there. There's one in there that probably I'm the only one in the class that knows about, and it happens to be one of the more gruesome ones. But everyone else in the, uh, uh, yeah, there's some tough ones in there. There's some nice ones in there. But it, it's it it's really a nice thing to get an image or to make a simile. Uh, very, very uh, a pleasant psychological experience. And so what we're trying to do is just another way of opening up intuition. Because intuition and observation are the all in astrology. Good judgment to tie them together. Uh, we're talking about the week after Thanksgiving, two weeks from today. They're not all entertainers either. Something like that, yeah. Yes. Well, if you think about what the different, uh, they're called attributes. The, what, if you think about what the different attributes do or don't do, it's easier to understand it. Like a common sign person, if it is epitomized, is somebody that always is a middle person. The, Cardinal sign people are always people that have to get something done. And Capricorn is like that. It administers to get things done. The fixed sign people take on problems that nobody else wants, and they stay with them and with them and with them. They, uh, they, they carry on. Uh, and there is like a certain degree of hardness in Capricorn, like the hardness of a diamond is, is Capricornian, but that is in fixity. You know, diamonds are very useful. You know, we can make industrial diamonds. So if you can picture people 
that want everything to change and want to drive the change versus people who want nothing to change and want something that is such quality and perfection that it doesn't ever have to change. And then somebody that has to communicate between the two of them with having as little of personal uh, personal self going into the communication so it can go between those two. Or is that... that Thank you very much.